specific groups and K3CT. Okay, so first I just want to thank uh, the organizers for giving me uh, the opportunity to speak today. So what I'm going to be talking about is mostly based on joint work with Miranda Chang and Roberto Volpato, which is uh, still to appear. Um, and let me start by talking about some motivation for uh, the work that I'm going to be talking about. Uh, and the general broad motivation is uh, the subject of moonshine, which is a very interesting connection between two mathematical objects. Uh, on the one hand, finite groups, and the second, modular forms. And as you'll see a little bit in the talk today, it has connections to many other areas of mathematics and string theory, which are still uh, being uncovered and uh, explored. Uh, and the particular um, uh, context I'll be focusing on today is uh, string theory compactified on K3 surfaces, which is of interest because um, these sigma models uh, coming from uh, uh, string compactifications on K3 probe uh, interesting uh, aspects of geometry and have connections with theory of lattices, number theory, modular forms, and group theory. So the main object I'm going to be sort of focusing on is the elliptic genus um, of a sigma model with target space K3. And here I have the definition of the elliptic genus just for a general n equals 2 comma 2 two-dimensional conformal field theory. Um, and it's given by the following trace here, where the operators inserted are uh, uh, described as follows. F, L, and F, R are left and right moving fermion number. And L0 and J0 are zero modes of the Beer-Soro and U1 um, R currents, which make up the n equals 2 superconformal algebra on the world sheet. And the elliptic genus is a useful co uh, quantity to compute um, in physics and mathematics because it is um, a topological invariant, so it's independent of the point out in moduli space at which you can compute it. And from the point of view of physics, it counts uh, what are called BPS states. So uh, in the two-dimensional conformal field theory, these are states where the right movers are in the ground state. There's just a Witten index for the right moving modes. Um, and therefore, the elliptic genus is a holomorphic function in tau. And then there's a spectrum of left moving states, which are graded by uh, U1 charge and energy level. And then the second uh, object I'll be considering in this talk is uh, what uh, we often call the twining genus or twined elliptic genus. Uh, which can be computed for some uh, conformal field theories with a discrete symmetry group given by, or uh, symmetry given by G, where you just insert the symmetry inside the trace. And now this uh, twining genus should have good modularity properties others under some subgroup of SL2Z, um, which preserves these G twisted boundary conditions. Um, and so the main uh, observation which motivates uh, what I'm going to talk about today is the observation of Iguchi, Iguri, and Tachikawa, three physicists, um, with, uh, w who in 2010 um, uh, sort of started this subject, which is now called Mathieu Munchine. So um, they were looking at the expansion of an elliptic genus of a K3 surface into characters of a, uh, n equals 4 superconformal algebra, which is the amount of uh, supersymmetry that exists on the world sheet uh, of a K3 sigma model. And what they found is roughly the following. There's a contribution from 24 uh, massless multiplets, and then some infinite tower of massive multiplets, which is encapsulated in the function here, q to the minus 1 eighth times these uh, numbers in the parentheses. And these coefficients of the massive states are these very interesting uh, positive integers, um, which they noticed were uh, related to sums of dimensions of irreducible representations of a per particular sporadic finite simple group uh, called the largest Mathieu group, M24. And so this is actually very similar to another um, um, observation in mathematics from a few decades earlier, which is known as monstrous moonshine. And uh, I'm going to try and briefly summarize this uh, vast field on just one slide. Um, so the basic observation of monstrous moonshine, which is very similar to the EOT observation, was made by uh, uh, Mackay when he was looking at the expansion of the J function um, in powers of Q. Um, the J function is a, a modular function which transforms under SL2Z with uh, weight 0. Um, and it's unique in that if you normalize it to start um, with the following um, power of a Q uh, with a coefficient of 1. Um, it's the only such modular uh, function. It takes value. Uh, it's a function of a, a single complex variable tau, which takes values in the upper half plane. And what Mackay noticed was this first coefficient, this 196884, is uh, equal to the sum of the two smallest 
uh, the dimensions of the two smallest representations of a different uh, sporadic uh, finite simple group called the monster group. It's the largest of these 26 uh, sporadic finite simple groups depicted here. Um, and this connection was very mysterious um, and, and until um, it was sort of eventually explained um, by a construction of a particular chiral conformal field theory by Frankel, Lepowski, and Merman. Uh, a bosonic chiral conformal field theory of central charge 24 compactified on a, a 24 dimensional torus given by R24 modded by uh, the Leech lattice. So the Leech lattice is a particular 24 dimensional even unimodular lattice with no vectors of length squared two. And if you take this conformal field theory and orbifold by a Z2 symmetry, which basically is a reflection about the origin, what you find is that it has partition function given exactly by J and it has a symmetry group, um, which is the monster group, which, so all of the states fall in uh, monster representations. And so once you know about the existence of this conformal field theory, the relationship between J and uh, J's, the coefficients of J and the dimensions of the monster are not, uh, is not quite so mysterious. So one would ultimately like to understand some kind of underlying theory um, to explain this uh, Mathieu Moonshine observation. So there are a few things that are different about Mathieu Moonshine from the case of monstrous Moonshine that I just described. One is that uh, the uh, automorphic object involved in Mathieu Moonshine is in fact what's known as a Mach modular form. Um, Mach modular forms were originally introduced by Ramanujan um, almost 100 years ago, but their mathematical properties were only explained by Zweigers about 15 years ago or so. Um, and I'll just, I have the definition here, but I'll briefly explain in words what it is. So a function, a holomorphic function, which I call H of tau is a Mach modular form. Um, if it's a function which transforms almost modularly under SL2Z, um, and if, it, uh, if there's an additional function called the sha its shadow, which I denote as F of tau, where when you add this particular integral of the shadow, uh, which is in fact some non-holomorphic piece, then the overall function on the left-hand side, called the completion of H, is modular but no longer holomorphic. So mock modularity sort of indicates a trade-off between having something which is holomorphic and not quite modular, or adding this piece, um, which is an integral of the shadow, and getting something which is no longer holomorphic but then now is modular. And mock modular forms have um, begun to be, or their um, Im impact in physics and mathematics has begun to be developed as well. And here I just mention a few uh, places where they occur naturally. So they often appear um, algebraically when considering characters of infinite dimensional Lie super algebras. Um, also, they appear in a geometric context when uh, considering elliptic genera of formal field theories with a non compact target space. And um, in, in particular, in string theory, um, they've been, uh, begun to be explored a bit in relation to the uh, counting of black hole microstates. So just as sort of a summary of the status of um, the understanding of Mathieu Moonshine, um, there are, it's similar to monstrous Moonshine, but um, our understanding is far com from complete, and there are probably uh, two key differences um, or at least two that I want to highlight. One is that the representations are governed by a Mach modular form um, instead of a modular form, and that supersymmetry is probably involved um, in whatever the uh, resolution to this uh, mystery is, because um, as I already said, you only see these dimensions of M24 representations if you know to decompose into superconformal characters. And then uh, I just have a few broader reasons why this subject is interesting in physics and mathematics. Um, first of all, um, there seems to be a relation to K3 surfaces, and K3 surfaces appear um, in many contexts in string theory, from black hole solutions to examples of ADS-CFT, um, as well as uh, connections with BPS states, understanding their structure and symmetries. Um, and I think it's not uh, too hard to motivate this. At this conference, there are many talks about um, structure of BPS states. Uh, there were many talks this week about that. And finally, um, this subject unites many different areas of both physics and mathematics, including uh, some I list here, group theory, number theory, geometry, string theory, and CFT. 
So now I'm going to talk a little bit more about what we know about uh, symmetries of K3 CFTs. Um, and uh, we can actually describe um, the symmetries which arise in the moduli space of K3 CFTs pretty precisely because the form of the moduli space um, is known exactly and has been known for a few decades. Um, so this is a moduli space of a type two string theory on, on K3. And you can think of the following components. Um, uh, first, this Grassmannian, which corresponds to a choice of um, basically a Ricci flat metric in B field on the K3 surface. So, uh, and it parameterizes a choice of a positive definite four plane, which I'll call pi throughout the talk in the space R four comma 20. And then um, uh, it's modded all out also by this automorphism group of gamma four comma 20, which is an even unimodular lattice of signature four comma 20, which you can think of as corresponding to the integral homology of the K3 surface. And using this form of, uh, of the moduli space, one can actually prove a theorem about what the symmetry groups are that arise at different points in the moduli space of K3 CFTs. And so I briefly um, summarize the theorem here, which was uh, proven by Gaberti, L. Honegger, and Vopato, and s roughly sketch in words what the proof is. So if you consider a particular K3 sigma model, which will be specified by a choice of uh, four plane pi. So this is like choosing a particular uh, K3 B field and uh, copy of n equals four comma four superconformal algebra. And you let um, the group G pi be the group of automorphisms of this particular sigma model. Um, it should be a subgroup of the automorphism group of this uh, unimodular lattice, which fixes this four plane because we want this group to preserve this n equals four comma four. And the uh, basic theorem of GHV is that this group is always a subgroup of the group Conway zero. This is the onmorphism group of the Leech lattice. And it's a subgroup which uh, fixes pointwise a sub lattice of the Leech lattice of rank at least four. And it's pretty easy to understand why this is the case. So one just considers the orthogonal complement of the four plane pi in this unimodular lattice, gamma four comma 20. So the orthogonal complement will have rank um, at most 20 uh, because, uh, and it will be negative definite because this uh, four plane has positive definite rank four. And so the orthogonal complement, if it has no vectors of length squared two, which means that the CFT is not singular, uh, can be embedded in the Leech lattice. And then, um, the, the group uh, G pi will just be a subgroup of the automorphism group of the Leech lattice that fixes the orthogonal complement of the orthogonal complement of pi or just fixes a sublattice of rank at least four. So what does this theorem mean for the observation of Aguchi, Uguri, and Tachikawa about the M24? Well, so the theorem summarized one more time is just that the symmetries of non-singular K3 sigma models have been classified and lie within this particular uh, sporadic group Conway zero, the automorphism group of the Leech lattice. Um, and they are uh, always subgroups that preserve a four dimensional subspace in its 24 dimensional representation. And so there are two um, somewhat, um, I guess, kind of puzzles or inconsistencies with the appearance of the M24 coming from this theorem. The first um, is, perhaps not so mysterious. Um, so in particular within this group, Conway zero, are, there are extra symmetries which do um, preserve a four dimensional subspace, but lie outside of M24. However, these symmetries only occur at particular isolated points in moduli space where the K3 uh, CFT is at an orbifold, torus orbifold limit. However, um, more, um, um, uh, confusingly, uh, there are symmetries within M24 that are not allowed by uh, this GHV classification. There are elements which only preserve a two-dimensional subspace in the, in the 24-dimensional representation. And these particular symmetries will never occur at a particular point in K3 moduli space. Okay, so though I'm not gonna answer the question about um, 
the origin of M24, I am going to talk about a couple extensions to this, to this result, um, two different ones. One where you take singular points into account in the K3 moduli space, and one where you consider world sheet parity. So consider the um, orientation of the left versus right movers along the world sheet, and, um, and ask the questions, or ask how the following questions are affected by taking these two things into account. Um, first of all, what groups can arise, and second of all, what kind of twining functions can arise. So um, perhaps more um, worrisome, or you might ask why consider uh, singular points in K3 moduli space if the CFT may not, uh, is not perturbatively well defined. Um, we've known for, for a while, however, that at these points, there's a good uh, description of the full 10-dimensional string theory. And in particular, the sing singular points correspond to interesting points in uh, the six-dimensional space-time with enhanced uh, non-abelian gauge symmetry coming from uh, massless modes of D-brains on the shrinking cycles of the K3 surface. So they do make sense within uh, the full 10D string theory. And a second reason to the, consider the singular points is to make a connection with the larger structure, which is known as umbral moonshine, which I'll describe briefly. So umbral moonshine um, is, was introduced by the following three mathematicians or physicists, Randa Chang, John Duncan, and Jeff Harvey. And what they showed is that Mathieu moonshine is, in fact, on the first example of a larger phenomenon known as umbral moonshine which relates discrete groups um, to Mach modular forms. And the relation is the following. So there, each instance of umbral moonshine is lab labeled by a particular lattice um, known as a Niemeyer lattice. And the Niemeyer lattices are even unimodular lattices of rank 24, um, which were, uh, have, get their name because they were classified by Niemeyer, who showed that there are 24 such lattices. There's the Leach lattice, which has no roots or no vectors of length squared two. And then there's 23 others who's, uh, who are uniquely determined by their root systems um, in that they're all unions of simply laced ADE type root systems. And so on this slide, I just want to briefly point out one thing. So uh, along the top line are just the root systems of the tw 23 different Niemeyer lattices. And the first line is the automorphism group of the Niemeyer lattice. What you notice that th is that this first Niemeyer lattice with 24 copies of A1 as its root system has automorphism group M24. In fact, this is not uh, a coincidence. This is related to the, the Matthew Moonshine observation. Um, it's, it's the group, uh, it's the automorphism group of the lattice when you don't take into account non-trivial automorphisms of the root lattice. So like the, so in the case of A2 A to the 12th, you get also an automorphism acting on the, the A2 root lattice, which exchanges the two simple roots. Um, and so if you, if you don't include that, you just get the bottom line. But the groups which are relevant for umbral moonshine are in fact the top ones, including that. Um, so for, uh, so, the brief description of the relationships of umbral moonshine is that you can define a group from each lattice, uh, which is given by the automorphism group of the lattice, modded out by the vial group, which acts as reflections on the root system. And you can also define a Mach modular form, in fact, a, a Mach modular form for each conjugacy class in this group, um, whose modularity properties are specified by the data of the root system in in a precise way, which I don't have to, time to describe, but the data of the root system tells you about the shadow of the Mach modular form, and whose coefficients are given by characters of the group. So one question you might have is if these other instances of umbral moonshine are related to K3CFT in a similar way to the first case, uh, which was discovered um, by looking at the elliptic genus of K3CFT. So I'll briefly describe a, a motivation for this um, from work I did with Miranda Chang a few years ago, which is that you can revisit the decomposition of the elliptic genus of K3 um, into uh, BPS and non-BPS n equals four multiplets. But uh, due to an identity between the short BPS representation and the elliptic genus of an A1 type singularity, you can also view this uh, decomposition 
uh, in a geometric way where there's a contribution coming from a singularity configuration based on the root system of the lattice and a contribution coming from the umbral moonshine mock modular form, which has characters of the automorphism group. And in fact, you can do this for all 23 cases of umbral moonshine. Um, and uh, there are in roughly, there, uh, there are 23 ways to separate the elliptic genus into parts. Um, one coming from the root system of the Niemeyer lattice, which corresponds to the uh, elliptic genus of the corresponding configuration of singularities, and one uh, coming from the umbral moonshine mock modular form, which has uh, characters of the corresponding group. So as an example, I just do the next, uh, the next case of umbral moonshine, where the uh, root lattice is 12 copies of A2. So you can also write the elliptic genus of uh, K3 in terms of a contribution from 12 A2 type singularities and a contribution from this mock modular form of umbral moonshine, um, which has uh, coefficients which are representations of this group 2.m12, which is the automorphism group of this Niemeyer lattice. And so why would uh, this be interesting? Well, you can also define twining genera for each conjugate C class in all of the uh, different umbral groups associated to each Niemeyer lattice. And as a consistency check, if you uh, call um, pi g just the eigenvalues of g and its 24-dimensional representation, this is often called a frame shape, then if g is a symplectic automorphism with a particular frame shape, um, one's guaranteed to get the same twining function no matter which group it comes from. But however, if g is some non-geometric symmetry, this uh, twining function can differ depending on which umbral group it's in. So one might ask if these twining genera as derived from umbral moonshine have any relation to symmetries of K3 sigma models. And so this question sort of motivates our uh, revisiting of this uh, theorem of GHV um, and uh, our uh, uh, question about including singular points in the moduli space of K3 CFTs. And you'll see the reason why um, as I describe uh, the generalization. So now suppose you have a particular K3 sigma model, which is singular, which means that this four plane pi that you choose um, is orthogonal to some root, some vector of length, where two in gamma four comma 20. So roughly the theorem goes through in the same way, except now you can't embed the orthogonal complement into the leech lattice, but you can embed it into some Niemeyer lattice. And so the group of automorphisms, g pi, is no longer a subgroup of Conway zero, which fixes a four plane, but a subgroup of the automorphism group of the corresponding Niemeyer lattice. And so um, roughly in words, uh, the theorem is that the orthogonal complement of the four plane, which defines the singular CFT, can be embedded in at least one Niemeyer lattice, and that its symmetry group is, an is a subgroup of the automorphism group of the lattice, which fixes pointwise a sublattice of rank at least four. And we also have a conjecture that we gather some evidence for in the paper that I don't have uh, time to describe here. That is that for each Niemeyer lattice, there exists a particular, um, a, a particular choice of K3 sigma models such that the orthogonal complement can only embed it, be embedded in that Niemeyer lattice, which sort of implies that all such lattices are important for the classification of symmetries of K3 uh, CFTs if you take into account singular points. Okay, so in the last uh, two minutes, I want to describe one more interesting aspect or sort of generalization of this, which is to take into account world cheap parity, which has a bearing on a particular kinds of symmetry, um, symmetries with, with, with what I call a multiplier. So um, I briefly outlined uh, 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 our result, the derivation of our result, which is if you consider the full twining partition function, so no longer an elliptic genus, but you consider um, uh, insertion of also the right moving U1 charge and insertion of some symmetry G, this reduces to the elliptic genus if you set this U bar to be zero. And this full twining partition function should transform nicely under some subgroup of, of SL2Z. Um, and uh, up to some overall constant. Now, when you set both z and u bar to be zero, you get the twined Witten index. Um, and in the parentheses, you get the usual elliptic, or transformations of the elliptic variables under SL2z. So this parenthesis goes away when z and u bar are zero. 
And so um, if this twined Witten index is not, um, is, is not zero, then this C has to be one. However, if it is zero, then C could be any complex number. And um, so the basic result is that if you consider some symmetry which maps the uh, left and right moving n equals four comma four algebras into each other, um, and you consider uh, the symmetry mapping G to um, G prime acting on, so C and C prime are the two copies of, uh, of the CFT with uh, inverted uh, world sheet parity and G and G prime correspondingly this uh, symmetry under world sheet parity. Then with a bit of algebra, you can show that if the multiplier of, of the elliptic genus of C is um, this, uh, is, uh, if the elliptic genus of curly C is C, then the multiplier of the world sheet parity related theory is C bar, it's the complex conjugate. And so this has a couple implications that if there's a function, uh, a twined uh, elliptic genus at some point in moduli space with a multiplier that is a complex number and it's not uh, plus or minus one, then it can only arise from a, a sigma model elliptic genus twined by symmetries acting differently on the left and right moving Hilbert spaces. Um, and secondly, if a, theory, if a theory has a, a twining function with a complex multiplier, then there must exist some other theory related by world sheet parity with the twining function with complex conjugate multiplier. Okay, so here's just my summary and some uh, conclusions. Um, so basically, uh, I just wanted to tell you two things. One is that if you revisit the classification of symmetries of K3 CFTs, uh, when you take singular points in, uh, in the moduli space into account, the uh, full set of uh, umbral groups are relevant for the classification of symmetries. And also there are certain geometric symmetries with complex multiplier system, which arise from uh, actions uh, sort of, uh, which are not invariant under world sheet parity symmetry. They act differently on left and right movers. So uh, there are many interesting questions which, uh, which are still open in this subject, and I just mentioned two here out of the many. One is that what, um, what implications do our better understanding of sporadic group symmetries in K3 sigma models um, have for other string theory compactifications involving K3? And finally, um, and probably the, the most pressing question for uh, solving the mystery of Mathieu Moonshine or Umbral Moonshine, um, what about uh, umbral symmetries uh, which don't preserve a four plane? Uh, this is sort of uh, necessary to understand for, for um, eventually figuring out uh, uh, the mystery of, of moonshine. So that's it. Questions? So uh, when we made this conjecture, uh, we expected, perhaps naively, that uh, since the uh, uh, elliptic genus of K3 is independent of the moduli of K3, so its symmetry uh, should be n coming from, not from uh, symmetry of CFT at a particular point in moduli space, but uh, yeah. perhaps uh, uh, a group which include all these uh, possible symmetry at all point in moduli mm -hmm. space. So, so you seem, you're suggesting, if I understand it correctly, that if you include CFT at singular, corresponding to singular point in K3, then you have to possibly enlarge symmetry in yeah, but, group. Well, so so the perhaps naive natural question would be, what would be the uh, symmetry that can include all of these groups? I think you would still have to move between different points in moduli space because you still have this four plane um, restriction. In fact, all of these groups can fit into the Conway group. So, um, um, but, but it's, it's sort of evidence for a more direct relation between um, all of the different cases of umbral moonshine and K3 CFT. But I think the question about how to combine different points in moduli space is still a very interesting one that people haven't been able to make much progress on precisely. Could you go back to equation 0 0.1? It didn't look like an index to me. It's the one where you had the U, you had the Z and the U oh. bar. 
Yeah, it's not an index. It's not an index. No, no, no. It's thought. only okay. to So where are you where are you calculating that if it's at not an index? At a particular point. Just for Is a this an orbifold K3 or something like that? I mean, how do you calculate it? Oh, you, you don't calculate it in general, but I mean, you don't I mean, you could calculate it at a particular orbifold point, but the right. point is just ma to make an argument about the form of of the multiplier. Um, at any particular for any particular choice of K3CF. Oh, I see. So you have you have a you have a claim about this or for any even for s s they're not exactly smooth K3s, right? Because is this is this at a singular point in K3 moduli space? No, this this is a, a just. Oh, you're just, just looking at this for a general K3. Yeah, just for model. a general K3. It's sort of an independent idea. Okay, but, so this is really hard to calculate away. Yeah, from, it's general hard to calculate, but you can still. Um, gain some understanding about what the symmetries are which have a complex multiplier just, okay. just from analyzing the modularity properties of this thing. But yeah, unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately, since it's so hard to calculate at any point, we haven't been able to find an example of a symmetry with some asymmetric action which yields this complex multiplier. Oh, really? Even by going to various orbifold points, you haven't found an example? or? Yeah, though we haven't tried for a very long time, but... Um, I see. So that's <laughs> so that's what you're going to try and do, right? You're going to yeah, go to an orbital point to try and get yeah. an example of what you're saying could happen. Yeah. I mean, it should happen if it exists. And from just from the theorems, of, I mean, there are conjectures that if you pick a, any sublattice of 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 gamma four comma twenty, you can define such a CFT, and you right. know that some of these symmetries exist as uh, actions on these sublattices. So we expect there to be such CFTs with these symmetries, but to access them is quite hard. Okay, and so I, I also had a, a sort of a comment, which is, how does G act on the Hilbert space? You see, I think that the equation is a little misleading, right? Because part of the whole mystery is that we don't know how G acts except for certain subgroups of Mathieu or, or Umbral Mushine. Yeah, so this is just for any, I mean, that's sort of the whole point, right? We don't know how G acts on the Hilbert space. Yeah. You know, when, when Matthias and his, uh, and his colleagues, you know, proved these theorems about twining genera, they had to use properties of modular forms. They didn't actually calculate the trace of G oh, on yeah. the Hilbert space. That's sort of that's but an important I, point. But I mean, I don't think I'm claiming to know how it acts. It's no, I know, I know yeah, that. Yeah. I'm just <laughs> stressing that. <laughs> I have also one question. So yeah. if, if one takes your correspondence with the umbral moonshine seriously, yeah, yeah. wouldn't one say that the, con the, the conventional material moonshine should arise for the singular K3 that corresponds to the A1 to the 24 case? Um, yeah, so we have to conject some further conjectures about which particular twining genera arise, because if the symmetry is non-geometric, the frame shape doesn't specify the twining genus uniquely. But there's still this four-plane um, constraint. So, but I mean, yeah. that may be an alternative to what Hiroshi was suggesting, yeah. that you have to sit at a very specific, slightly singular K3 that corresponds to this Niemeyer case in order to see all of M24. That's sort of a, one way of thinking about this yeah. uh, umbral groups. Anyhow, since there are no further questions, oh, sorry, there is. Just a comment. Yeah. There is no case where A1 to the 24 is completely realized. You cannot get all 24 singularities. So there's, it's the rank, it's the, having a fixed plane of rank 4 condition sort of shows up again. Yeah, so, uh, that's true, uh, too. So there, you know, it's, it's tempting to say, take the sublocus of the moduli space that's related to that particular Niemeyer lattice, but that's very hard to analyze. Anyhow, in view of time, let's uh, thank the speaker again. Thank you.